From the late 11th to the 13th century, the Kiptrak Kuman Confederation was the most influential steppe power before the rise of the Mongol Empire, controlling a domain from the Danube River through modern Kazakhstan, influencing politics in Hungary, Bulgaria, the Caucasus, and Khwarezm until the Mongol invasion in the 1230s. Chances are, you know them best as the guys who wore the battle masks with mustaches on them. But who were they? What was the nature of their confederation? In this video, we will look at the history of this influential group. Known by a number of names, Kumin, Kipchak, Polovzi, Kangli, Kun, and others, they were a collection of loosely organized nomadic Turkic tribes. While Kipchak and Kumin are their best known names, the relationship between these terms is unclear. If they were originally two distinct tribes who merged, or names for the same people. The Rus and European names connote pale or yellow colors, thought to be due to the distinct blonde hair of the Kumin on the borders of Europe. Archaeology tends to show the westerly Kumins with more Caucasian features, while the Kiptrak of the Volga region appearing more Asiatic. The region became known to Muslims as the Deshti Kipchak, and in Europe as Kumania, even during Mongol rule. The origins and history of the Kipchak Kuman Confederation has received a daunting amount of scholarship. Chinese, Islamic, Byzantine, and European sources, alongside archaeological and linguistic evidence and a healthy amount of inferring, has produced multiple theories. To explain them all in detail would need a three hour video, at the speed I make these things about a year of work. Here, we'll just present a general consensus. The main influence being the work of historian Peter Golden, whose arguments I found most convincing. The ancestors of the Kipchak Kumans came from Mongolia and Manchuria. The 9th and 10th centuries saw the collapse of a number of powerful empires, most importantly the Tang Dynasty in China. With the fall of the Tang, the Khitans established the Lao Dynasty in North China and Mongolia. The Khitans were a semi-nomadic people related to the Mongols and their rise resulted in tribes fleeing Khitan dominance. And the following two centuries of Khitan rule and internal revolt pushed more peoples west, especially around 1018 and around 1120, when the Jurchen tribes toppled the Lao and established the Jin dynasty, also prompting Khitans under Yeludashi west to establish the Karakatai in the 1130s and 40s. Keep in mind that these western movements were waves of mainly Turkic but also proto-Mongolian and even Tungusic peoples. As these groups moved west, as armies, families and tribes, they broke apart, incorporating new peoples or were themselves incorporated, so that by the time they reached the western steppe, they often bore little resemblance to their original forebears. The tribal movements beginning circa 1018 is called by the Persian writer Marvazi the Kun Migration. We can assume the Kun movement brought the original Kumans west. The Kiptrak first appear in the 8th century Orhan inscription as a part of the Gokturk Haganite, and after its collapse joined the Kimek Union, a loosely organized collection of tribes under the Kimek. By the 9th century, Islamic geographers noted the Kiptrak were autonomous within the Kimak, evidently standing out among them. The Kimak moved west over the 9th and 10th centuries, displacing Oghuz Turk tribes, but largely broke up by the 11th century, when the Kun migration swept up the Kimak tribes. Already noted for their autonomy, the Kiptrak maintained their identity, and a confederation of Kiptraks and Kumans made their way west, neither truly subsuming the other. By the end of the 11th century, they were interacting with the Rus, destroyed the Pechenegs in cooperation with the Byzantines, and dominated or displaced local Turkic tribes. What was the exact dynamic here? The consistency of name use suggests two distinct tribes and regional groupings, but by the 13th century, travelers like William of Rubruck and John de Plano Carpini indicate a rather fluid use of terminology, the line between Kipchak and Kumin blurred. Further complicating matters are related groups like the Kangli and Oberli, which the sources depict as branches of the Kipchak, 
Peter Golden argued the Old Burly moved west after the collapse of the Lao, and were originally Mongolic speakers who were absorbed by the Eastern Kipchaks. Turkicizing, but as a militarily potent, centralized band became a leading and distinct people of this union, while the name Kangli is often connected to Kang, a term for the Middle Sardaria region, as well as being a Turkic term for a cart. Whatever the origin of the Kangli were, by the 12th century they were closely connected to the Kipchak, and later, the Old Barely, inhabiting the area east of the Ural River. Altogether, we call the Kipchak Kuman Confederation. Though there were individual powerful Khans, nothing suggests a centralized state, and there is no evidence for literacy among the Kipchaks. Regional Kipchaks took part in the politics of neighboring states, often as mercenaries and of course, as raiders. The Khwarezmians were noted for intermarrying with Kipchak Kanglis. By the 13th century, they made up most of Khwarezm's army. The famed King David the Builder of Georgia invited 40,000 Kipchak in around 1118 to help repel the Saljuks, even marrying a Kipchak Khan's daughter. From the 1150s, Kuman communities were present in Hungary and the Balkans. And in the 1180s, the Bulgarians and Vlachs relied heavily on Kuman military assistance to push out the Byzantines and establish a second Bulgarian Empire. In the Rus principalities, Kuman interaction was extensive. While the Kuman Polovzi raided the Rus, they were often doing so at the behest of a Rus prince who requested their military assistance against some rival, and to cement those ties, a number of Rus princes married Kuman wives. Connections were also economic, as steppe horses were prized as mounts for warfare among the Rus, as were the animal furs the Kipchak had access to. Rus merchants traveling through the steppe paid tax to Kuman Khans for safe passage, and a number of towns, if not established by the Kipchak, were certainly ruled by them in the steppe. The Kuman Kipchak Confederation met a violent end against the Mongols in the 1230s. The Mongols considered the Kipchak dangerous foes a threat to their position as a steppe empire. Around 1209 or 1219 was the first Mongol Kipchak confrontation, when Kangli, who had granted asylum to Merkits, were attacked by an army under Subade and Juchi. Kangli tribes and Khwarezmian service fought the Mongols in their invasion of Khwarezm, and famously, a joint Kipchak Rus force was defeated by Subade at the Battle of the Kalka River in 1223, though the Kipchak tribes remained unconquered until the 1230s. During that great western invasion, the Kipchak and Volga Bulgars were primary targets. Some chiefs, such as Bachman of the Oberli, put up a valiant resistance, but many were slaughtered or fled west. Some Kumans under their Han, Khotian, fleeing to Hungary, drawing the Mongols there. Ultimately, the extensive Kipchak steppe became the territories of the Golden Horde, ruled by the descendants of Juchi. But that was not the end of the Kipchak. While now under Mongol political authority, Kipchaks made up much of the military, and over the 13th and 14th centuries, smaller Mongolian population mixed with the Kipchaks and other Turkic tribes. So great was the Kipchak presence that the Golden Horde in the sources is often called the desht e kipchak or the Kipchak Khanate. While the Juchids Turkicized, political legitimacy rested on descent from Chinggis Khan. Accompanying the Golden Horde's rule was the gradual conversion of the Kipchaks and other local Turkic tribes to Sunni Islam, replacing their traditional animist, shamanist, and tengriist beliefs. Kipchaks were also brought east by the Mongols, present in Karakoram and in the Yuan dynasty, where an entire regiment of Kipchaks was established. El Timur, of Oberli descent, was one of the most powerful and influential ministers in the final decades of the Yuan in China. During this period we also see the emergence of Kipchak-ruled dynasties in Egypt and India. The Ayyubids of Egypt and Syria, and the Gurud Sultanate, which controlled parts of northern India, relied on imports of Turkic and Kipchak slave soldiers from the steppe, known as Gulams or Memluks. In 1210, Iltutmish and Oberli Gulam took power in the Delhi Sultanate, beginning nearly 60 years of Kipchak rulers, including Iltutmish's daughter Raziya Sultana, the only female Muslim ruler of Delhi. In the 1250s, the Kipchak and other Turkic Mamluks seized power from the Ayyubids, defeating the Mongols at Ain Jalut in 1260. 
One of the victors at Ain Jalut, the energetic Baybars, was a Kipchak, and under him and his successors, the Crusader states were destroyed. The Kipchak, Turkic influence and tactics were important for both states to successfully resist Mongol invasions in the latter 13th century. Today, Kipchak is still a major linguistic branch of the Turkic languages, with millions of speakers, the ethnonym Kipchak still present, and a source of pride among many of them. In future videos, we will discuss in further detail Mongol-Kipchak interactions, such as the Kalka River battle and the Mongol conquest of the Kipchak steppe in the 1230s. 